Again, I'd like to acknowledge that Queens is situated on the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. We are grateful to be able to live, learn, and play on these lands. My name is Mark Swartz, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm the scholarly publishing librarian in the library. I am delighted to introduce our speaker for today, Gunnar Blom, who is a leading researcher in the field of sensory motor control in computational neuroscience. He will share with us his vision and insights on the future of community-led open access infrastructure through his project Scholar Nexus, which is a platform that aims to create a seamless ecosystem for open scholarly publishing. And just for a little bit of context about Open Access Week, it's a global initiative that celebrates open access to scholarly information. And the theme this year is community over commercialization. Um, and it represents an opportunity for us to join together, take action and raise awareness about the importance of community control of knowledge sharing systems. And without further ado, uh, please join me in welcoming Gunnar Vlog. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much for this invitation. It's an honor to be here. And I must admit that uh, I feel a bit uh, insecure. Uh, I'm not a librarian. I'm not trained as a librarian. And I'm talking to you about stuff that you're much more familiar uh, with than I am. So um, hopefully I can uh, add something to it, maybe the perspective of the researcher and why I think as a researcher, we need better uh, dissemination tools, in particular publishing platforms. So first of all, as I said, I'm not a publishing expert. I'm not a librarian or information scientist. I'm just an ordinary researcher. And I'm also uh, one of the co-founders and co-directors of Scholar Nexus. So whatever I say might be biased or tinted um, by this. So for today, I want to essentially divide my presentation up in three parts. One is sort of like the status quo and how we publish and related aspects. Then I'd like to uh, take you a little bit into dreamland and talk about utopia. And then specifically, I'll try to address at least some of those um, topics or dreams with Scholar Nexus or the proposal of Scholar Nexus, because we haven't really started building it yet. OK, so what's the status quo? So as a researcher, there's many steps involved in the research process, from identifying a problem to evaluating literature, create hypotheses, design research, potentially describe a population, collect data, do the analysis of the data, and writing a report and publishing it. And if you think about where access to the literature comes in, it's pretty much at every, almost every single step along the way in the research process. So for a researcher, as you know, it's really critical to have access to um, existing literature, but also have access to the publishing system so that I can disseminate my findings. And luckily there's libraries um, who have subscriptions to all the hopefully important uh, paywalled articles and or people nowadays pay extra open access publishing charges, as you know, um, to make their work publicly available. And I should probably, uh, no, my phone is silent, I don't know. It was like a voice coming from here. Apologies for that. Um, now, one of the issues, of course, is that the cost of accessing um, published work has increased much more than, for example, the cost of living. So that's the red curve over here. And that puts a lot of strain onto um, the uh, libraries, obviously. Um, but also on the researchers, because ultimately that means that the libraries can afford fewer um, uh, fewer journals, and so therefore I will have trouble accessing the research that's relevant for me. Now, when the work is done, that's typically when we start thinking about publishing ourselves, not just accessing the literature, but actually producing a component of the literature. So we will write, obviously, and then submit to um, you know, what we think is like the top tier journal typically, right? We want to try very hard. And then we wait typically four months for to get a response. And your response typically is reject, right? We all we all know this. And and revise. And so, you know, we take the feedback, we try to revise. We send, we reformat, because typically we have to reformat the whole thing because a different journal has different requirements. And then we um send it to the next journal and we wait again and you know. You go around a loop like that, you go down the list of priority in terms of, you know, the 
importance or perceived importance of the journal until we finally get an acceptance. And then we have to still do some edits, and then we can finally move on, hopefully. Now, once, oh yeah, and one important aspect I want to mention is that in the system, the real feedback on our work that we get is essentially at the publication process, not throughout the research process, not before the publication. And the feedback is sort of like very constrained, right? We typically have like two, three reviewers and that's it, done. Now, once we get the acceptance, there's a whole process before the paper is actually made publicly available. First of all, we have to transfer IP of the paper to the, to the publisher typically. You have to pay the author processing charges, potentially the open access fees. Then there's typically an embargo for various reasons. And then we'll essentially usually get a static paper that is paywalled unless we have paid the open access fees. Doesn't quite sound ideal to me. Now, one of the reasons why it's paywalled, of course, is because the publishing system is highly profitable. And this is from 2017. I don't think it got any better. Um, but it's just to tell you something about where the taxpayer money actually goes. And I think we can do a little bit better than that as a community. Now, the, the publishers, of course, say, well, wait, yes, we have like, you know, some profit, but we also provide a lot of support for the research community. So here's a different way of depicting the research process. So from one to 12, it sort of like goes through different stages, asking the question, gathering materials, collect data. And you have the traditional role of the publishers here in, in gray, sort of like the submission and peer review aspect and dissemination aspect. And then you have further on, sort of like more the networking, research evaluation, high level, the things kind of like the data that the universities often are interested in because they want to know how well do researchers do. Now, what does, in this case, um, Elsevier provide? Well, they provide a whole ecosystem of different tools that help the researchers throughout the different steps. And obviously these tools cost money and things like that. So here's some of the potential added value. And that's all great if only Elsevier, mother company, wasn't Relks, who defines itself as a data broker. In fact, sells, of course, accumulates, of course, all kinds of information, including credit cards, etc. Accumulates that, um, and then sells it to, for example, immigration agencies who are not allowed themselves to collect that data. That, should, that fact alone should just tell us something. So, this is obviously not what we want. Right? We don't want a data monitoring system. We want a system that actually helps us publish it. And this is not an Elsevier problem. This is a problem throughout all the different publishers. So you can see the different stages uh, at the top of sort of like the research project and then the different tools for the different um, big publishing houses that they provide. Um, and again, along the way, they all collect data. I would argue that the current research cycle is really outdated. The way we do research is outdated. First of all, it's slow, as I mentioned, right? So from submission to distribution, it can take years. And that really slows down our pace and, and, and the innovation that comes along. Second, it's biased. So typically, you know, we are subjected to editorial opinions and there is a certain cost in the system that locks out diversity of researchers, of scholars around the world, and it also locks out um, early career researchers. So here's just an example um, on the left-hand side of sort of like the bias in the world. This is a particular metric that is the number of editors compared to the number of authors across the world. So the more there is, the more sort of like um, but the higher the values, the greener the values in this case on the on the top map, uh, the more you have a uh, imbalance towards having more impact, essentially more editorial uh, supervision of those countries compared to others. And in the bottom part, any countries that are North American, European, and Oceanian and blue, and the Asian, African, and South American countries are in red. And so you can totally see that this imbalance is true throughout um, 
uh, the different measures here. Uh, it doesn't really matter what the measures exactly are. Um, so low is always uh, bad underrepresented, high is overrepresented, essentially. Here's another kind of graphic. This is a uh, um, per country modified age index. It's a bit of a weird value, but I think an, an age indices obviously have all kinds of issues attached to themselves. Uh, but I think it, it reflects sort of like what is act what actually matters is like how much are different people allowed to contribute to partake in the scientific endeavor, right? And if they're not getting cited, then they're essentially left out. And so you can totally see that that you know essentially North America and Europe, Australia and Japan included, are the countries that really predominantly where research predominantly gets cited. And the other ones are sort of like left behind. And I would argue that's not good. And finally, the uh, current research cycle is badly incentivized. So researchers select research problems that are optimized for the publication process because that, these are the most likely ones to actually get published instead of really pursuing what is of interest for the general public or, or however you define um, what's optimal for knowledge advancement. And obviously that creates barriers that we don't want for society. So in summary, we like essentially like, you know, we spend billions of dollars every year of taxpayer revenue, all so that publishers can put a PDF online, quite literally. It takes on average six to 24 months, and that range is essentially like highly field specific. So certain fields have different processes. Um, that's what is this large range. But only like it takes that long for like two or three people to comment on a paper and give you feedback to sort of review it, right? There's no other reason why it should take that long. And the uh, sort of underlying problem is, of course, prestige, right? Like we get evaluated as researchers based on what we publish, the prestige of the journal, and so that's what we want to pursue. And so essentially, as the flip side of that is that the journals essentially literally cater to a scientific elite at the cost of diversity and inclusion. And I, I would argue that that has, a, that has a cost for a society that is unacceptable. Now, this isn't all like sort of like old news, of course, you probably all know this. Um, scientists, funders, consumers, everyone has sort of like noticed this and expressed certain degrees of like discontent and frustration with it. It's gone through the popular press as well as, or general public press as well as um, scientific press. Now, why do we keep doing this? And I would argue there's, there's two sort of like main reasons. Well, the second part being other reasons. But the first one, and probably the most important one, is career advancement. The way that the system, the academic system is currently built is that career advancement is tightly linked to our publications, right? So, in order to have good career advancement, we need high impact factor publications in most places still now. And these journals that have the high impact factor and predominantly for publish, uh, for, for profit um, uh, publishing house on it. There's of course also field specific journal reputation, so it's not just all impact factor. Um, but again, the same the same uh, aspects so mm -hmm. the same considerations um, apply. And then there's peer expectations, right? And that's sort of like, that's not really with respect to career advancement directly, but indirectly it is. If, you know, Mark here sits on my tenure committee and, you know, thinks that I should really have published in like whatever journal, then, and I haven't, that's not good for me, right? Now, there's a bunch of other reasons why uh, we keep doing it the way we're doing it. One is that more um, modern, I would say, open science approaches are typically extra work. And those open science approaches are often pushed more by the nonprofit community than the for-profit publishers because they also come at a cost for the publisher. So they don't really want to do that. Um, but for researchers, it's also something that is not really um, any, that have, doesn't, doesn't add any value to my CV, right? It's not incentivized. If I publish my code, if I publish my data, or whatever it is, people will not really give me extra points, points for that for my career advancement. 
Um, going with the old publishers is essentially the path of least resistance. Journals are supposed to at least advertise our work for us. So, you know, so again, it's easy. They produce pretty looking PDFs. And in many cases, that's not so much the case in sort of like more in-house or overlay type journals, for example. And my colleagues might publish there. So, you know, I want to fit in. And I'm going to leave this with, with you for a second here. Okay. So, how can we potentially do better? Or what would better look like? So, let, let's, let's dream a little bit. Or I will dream. Hopefully, I will, you will follow along in the dream. Um, so to me, what would a better publishing system look like? Well, wouldn't it be great if anyone could provide feedback on a publication, right? And guess what? That exists. It's called post-publication peer review. And on top of that, you could even incentivize those reviews or valorize those reviews, that feedback, by, for example, giving them DOIs, making them citable, allowing for people to interact with those reviews themselves. Right? So all of a sudden, it's not just like me being a reviewer and then it gets locked away. It's like, well, I've done this gatekeeping here. I'm actually helping the process and there's a written trace. I'm allowing everyone to participate. Wouldn't it be great if qualified, likely interested readers and reviewers would automatically get notified of interesting work being made available? Again, that is something that exists. There's recommender systems, for example, right? And you would only get a notification for published work that you're actually interested in and not just random tables of contents you have to scroll through of like stuff you not in my field, right? Wouldn't it be great if our publications would automatically get advertised? Again, the technology for that, to send it out on social media, to build individualized tables of contents, uh, recommender systems, et cetera, et cetera. Wouldn't it be great if the reader could access review comments and replies? If a reviewer had a comment or a question, it's a very likely the reader has the exact same question. I would like to know how the, how the author answered to the, answered that. Right? This is where open peer review comes in. Again, something that exists. And I want to see the history of how a paper evolved. Often that's very telling, it's very informative, especially for trainees. But maybe also for other reasons or established researchers. Wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to reformat manuscripts every time I sent them to a different journal, manually reformat? Well, if the work we, um, we write up was in a way, written in a way where we separate content from format, then it would be really easy to do. We could automatically parse and recompile content into the right format. In fact, that's how publishers typically do it. And it would also allow us to flexibly configure what is displayed, right, on a website, on my phone, on a tablet, they're all different formats. And maybe I have preferences. Maybe for every paper that's um, in, a, in a table of content, I want the abstract right there. Maybe that's too cluttering for me. I just want to see the titles. Maybe I just want to see the author summary. I can easily configure that. Not something we can do right now. Wouldn't it be great if authors, reviewers, and readers got immediate access to related papers and content, right? I say something, citation. Here's a bunch of other articles. I describe a methods, a particular aspect of methods. Here's other papers that have used those methods. Right? So at every single level, you can imagine, we can automatically provide related content. And guess what? That technology exists as well. For example, through connected papers, semantic matchmaking, right? citation trees, etc. That would enhance the papers. It would allow for faster learning as well. Again, accelerate science. 
That'd be great if papers could be included in multiple collections or used in meta collections instead of being imprisoned in a single instance and forever in one place without us authors actually having copyrighted that paper. And this one is one that I think is really important. Wouldn't it be great if we could include code and videos and other media, presentations, teaching materials, whatever it is, as a public, as part of the publication? And not just sort of like here's a file, here's another file, here's another file in the appendix attached, not all in one coherent document. And again, this is something we can actually do. Jupyter Notebooks does it, not, not particularly well necessarily, but you know, it works really well. And the added value to that is that you can, if you embed code, for example, you can auto-generate results, figures, statistics, right? And all of a sudden, it's fully transparent. There's no, no cheating. It's like generated on the fly. It's right there in front of you. And you can reuse it, right? Oh, wait a minute. I want to do the same analysis on my data. I can just upload my data into it and run the exact same code, right? So it has really multiple levels of benefits. That is what, in my mind, a modern publishing infrastructure should or should be able to handle. A long list. Um, <laughs> would it be great if there were no paywalls and exorbitant author publishing charges? I don't think I have to like hammer this down too hard. Uh, diamond open access is obviously what we all thrive for, and and I would argue the reason why this should be no big deal is because. As scholars, we're already doing all the work for the publishers, right? We're doing the reviewing, we're doing the editing, uh, we're doing the writing, we're doing the formatting nowadays as well. Like what's left? The PDF on the website? That's easy infrastructure. Wouldn't it be great if papers were living documents that grow collaboratively with the research instead of being these sort of like outdated monoliths, standalone things? Right? I want to be able to modify them, to add to them. Here's a story. Oh, here's an element for new data. I want to like just dump that in. And like, like here's an additional piece of the story. I don't want to rewrite the whole paper. Now everyone has to sort of like try to figure out what's the difference between this paper, this paper, this paper. What have they added, subtracted? Oh my goodness. Right? It's terrible. So is everyone there. Would it be great if there was no gatekeeping? I'll leave this with you for a second. In my opinion, scientists should really be able or should be the ones who decide what is published, right? We produce the work. We should be able to decide we want to publish this now. This is ready. And of course, we want lots of feedback. Feedback is very important for science. But it shouldn't be an editor or a reviewer to decide whether this is publishable here right now or not. And so on and so on. So I can we can come up with arbitrary many other sort of like uh, points that you can dream about it would be be great. One potentially that would argue is sort of fundamentally the most important one is that we would like a publishing system that really supports the research community or the, the scholarly community in general, that supports collaboration and knowledge sharing. And that is really important because we want to optimize the research program or optimize for research progress. Right? That, is, that is ultimately what we thrive for. That's what the governments are funding us for. That's what the universities want. That's what we want as scholars. That's what we're here for. We don't want to spend months and months on formatting papers, on being slowed down, on waiting for reviewer comments, et cetera, et cetera. It seems so inefficient. If you just step back and think about it, it's like totally inefficient. And instead, what we have is this like elitist gatekeeping for profit system that is like totally dissociated nowadays from the value of scientific work and scientific publishing. And that's not good. Okay, so how do we plan with Skull and Nexus to change things? Let me first briefly say something about why we think, why we hope we might be able to succeed with this. 
there is, of course, a huge amount of previous um, attempts to, you know, make science more open, etc. But we think that there is fundamentally a few key things that have um, not necessarily been considered or has not gotten enough attention that has um, sort of like hindered their success. So at first, the existing approaches have typically limited user interface. Um, and now that's often so like user interface is often like unintuitive and lacking in functionality, very constrained. It's really not like nice to use. It's like complicated, convoluted, et cetera. And at Solar Nexus, we really want to make sure that it's going to be an easy, intuitive interface with rich functionalities for readers, reviewers, authors. So we want this to be a delightful experience. In a certain way, we want to sort of create the iPhone, recreate the iPhone experience for publishing. I don't know if you remember when iPhone first came out. They haven't actually invented anything new. It was just the everything became integrated and seamless, right? This and approaches have typically little added or accrued and or accrued value. Um, and really what we, so what we want to pay attention to is that both readers and reviewers add values for each other. So that is through, for example, public ratings, public reviews, rating of reviews, interactions, tagging, um, trading collections that are shareable, et cetera. And existing approaches, I would argue, have really no incentive to contribute to as a researcher, right? So there's, I think, over 400 open peer review platforms out there, believe it or not. None of them has taken off. Why? Because if I participate, I get nothing out of it. Literally, it's like a little drop in a bucket somewhere that's going to be forgotten about, right? So therefore, for us, it's really important to do strong incentive engineering. So we can think about, you know, turning the platform into turning a review into a privilege, for example. You will get five reviews per year that you have to decide smartly on which how to use them. Oh, so now it's a privilege to work with. Um, we will have like a, like evaluate or potentially implement like status. So, you know. How much of an expert are you? How good are your reviews, et cetera? That might unlock some features. We'll provide metrics in terms of career for participants, but not age index kind of metrics. We want to have like metrics that actually reflect the value of science scholars in general in their interaction with the community. Like think more sort of like ultimate. And of course, incentives also to review are things like you can get cited. Your reviews can get cited. They're publicly available. So therefore, it's actually part of the scientific discourse out there openly. Like when you go to a conference, same kind of idea. And existing approaches really silo papers, right? They lack integration. And what we want is we want interoperability, um, in terms of readability of the papers from across platforms. So more generally, a sort of like new academic knowledge sharing system in our um, minds needs to be competitive. And that is because we want to allow as many players as possible to contribute and innovate, try things out. We really need to experiment more. Um, it needs to be interoperable, as I said in many different ways. It obviously needs to be archival. I don't need to tell you this because we don't want to lose that information. And we don't also, we don't want any for-profit organization to scoop it up and lock it away. It needs to be integrated, as I said. So it's not just that we put like specific tools out there, but we need to have an integrated system to be competitive with the established integrated systems, right? A single tool will not be competitive. We have to provide a full-fledged alternative. So this is really what we're working um, towards. Um, Scholar Nexus will essentially 
paths are like three layers. One is the archival layer, the foundation, what we call the foundation. Right? And so this is essentially a consortium of libraries and decentralized repositories that are jointly owned by the library consortium. That's how we envision things. The next layer is sort of like the interoperability or interaction layer. So this is where the and there would be an API that allows users to access that database. There would be a graph knowledge, and of course, all the code would live there that we would make openly available for people or expressly with the wish that people would use that code, reuse it, innovate on that code, recompile that code in different ways. And then, of course, we have the top layer. This is really what's what sort of like the public or the researchers would see. Those are the interfaces, the repositories, the journals, the, the collections, whatever you want to do there, right? So these should be community centric and of course, as I said, allow for um, experimentation. Now we have two in particular. One is the open access knowledge tree, oak tree, and the other one is open. Um, that we're trying to develop in parallel to sort of showcase how we can recompile the same set of tools into two different platforms. Now, personally, I'm more involved with Oak Tree, so I'm going to mostly focus on that. But I want to just like briefly give you a bit of a flavor of how we, what we envision that might look like. And so we've actually developed like sort of like a non-functional prototype so that we have a common vision and starting point for developers to start implementing those things. And I just want to show you a little bit about like what that looks like to make it very concrete. So this would be a landing page for Oak Tree. So you get there, you get pub, you get articles, you know, a little picture, some some article here. Um, you get um, what's the point? What's the best way for me to point? Maybe with the mouse here, so that the online people can see it. So you get um, some ratings here about this article, tags, right? And then you have the top bar where you can do searches. Uh, you're in the reading mode right now. You can review, you can publish. You have your identity here. Now, if you click on an article, you actually get the, the full article view. So like the standard view, I guess, how we're used to it. But we'd also get access to all the reviews and ratings from the reviewer, including here, anonymous reviewer number one has written some stuff about it. And if you then scroll down, you can also get the author response to that anonymous review including how the author response was rated. And of course, the reviewer's comment was also rated here. Now, when I read that, I might say like, hey, wait a minute, I have something to say because I have feedback, so I can just click on the review button and I can add my own review right, to the paper. Right now, this is a general review, but we also want to have things like we have on, uh, you might be familiar with it from Medium, where we can just highlight a sentence or a paragraph or whatever and specifically comment on that. So all kinds of features that make the interactivity much more enjoyable. And of course, we get a reviewer dashboard where there's our like statistics in terms of reviews um, at, the, at the top here, and then also um, suggestions of other papers that would qualify based on our profile to review. But this is where recommended systems come in, of course. Um, there's specific reviews that you might have done um, that are uh, here, with including their rating. And as an author, I would then, of course, get to see this, by the way, from open, and get to see my own paper and the reviews, and I can then directly reply to the reviews, and I can also do um, the sort of norms, and I can also do the live editing if you want of the paper directly here. So you can see something is like um, edited in that paper. And of course, version control and everything is in the background. I can have bookmarks, right? I can bookmark the interest in articles. I can have communities. I can create communities. I can create collections essentially that are publicly available for sharing. So now this is almost like compiling my own little journals, if you want, right? Here's my topics of interest. Who else? Like, you know, like the, the, the reading lists or follower lists or whatever it is that you have on different social media um, websites. This is very analogous to that. 
And you can also scrape your own communities and add to them, et cetera. Now, of course, I want to publish as well, right? So obviously, we need a publication button. So that takes me to my publishing dashboard where I have my current publications, including some statistics, um, including uh, ways to improve the paper. So this is what you see in the bottom here. This is how I can improve my paper based on the feedback I get. I get some statistics about readership. Um, but now I want to uh, essentially upload a new paper. And what we do is we essentially right now, this is an example, take the work a Google Doc document, upload it, and it, get autom it gets automatically parsed. And you can do that with pretty much any file format, including PDF nowadays. And so then we do some checks on the uh, uh, right hand side here. We do some checks to make sure that everything is there, compiled correctly. Oh, wait a minute. You forgot to put in conflict of interest statement. Please add that, right? Etc. And then you can make your paper public and it's published. So it's essentially sort of like a, an enhanced preprint repository, if you want. Once you have your publications with your feedback, you can now say, wait a minute, I want to actually submit that to a traditional journal because, you know, I haven't gotten tenure yet and I really need to um, play the incentives games for that. Um, so you get to a page that allows you to automatically format um, your paper to a particular journal. So you're like, oh, my yeah. algorithm says that this is a good journal for this particular paper and it'll automatically format it into the right PDF, then you can submit it, download it, submit it. Maybe there might be ways for us to actually uh, shortcut the, the, the submission process as well by providing a list of copy and paste fields, you know, so that when you go to the whatever website or whatever publisher and you have to click through the hundreds of menus about now copy and paste the abstract here, now copy and paste all the authors here, et cetera, et cetera, that can all be pre-formatted. Okay, right, so this is just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what that might look like and the kind of functionality. Obviously, I haven't talked about an actual writing tool, an authoring tool. That could be something that looks a little bit like Jupyter Notebooks or something, sort of like, you know, uh, Content Forward, um, MyST, Markdown, whatever type um, uh, format. Um, format. Uh, that, that would be great. And, and we're working on that as well. So, Scholar Nexus really wants to align the scientists or scholars and the library incentives while creating a flexible marketplace, in quotation, if not for profit, for innovation, right? So we want the library partnership or this partnership subsidy model to make this whole endeavor after we've developed it sustainable. Um, we want to credit more types of work than is currently being done. And that is essentially to fulfill the career incentives for scientists, but also reduce the incentives for publishing bad science. Ultimately, our hope is, of course, that people will realize that they don't really need to go down the route of the traditional journal systems anymore because everything that they need for the dissemination of the science is right there. And, and our hope is, of course, as well, that that will be recognized as such by um, academia and particularly the people who evaluate early career researchers. So in short, we want to provide a modern self-publishing tool with peer-to-peer -peer feedback and improved algorithms for recommendation that reduce innovation time cycle and remove sources of bias at all levels. These are the people working on it. It's all alphabetical, so I apologize for putting myself in the first position here. Um, so we have a nice core team here. Uh, this is our advisory board and our uh, Incubator and fiscal sponsor right now is uh, Neuromatch. Finally, I'd like to end by first of all thanking you all, of course, and um, maybe a bit of a call for action. Um, if you know of anyone who might be interested in funding this, or if you're independently wealthy and don't know what to do with your funds, please let me know. <laughs> um, but quite, quite seriously, we are looking for ways to fund, in particular, the initial development 
Once the initial development is done, we essentially want to hand over the product to the consortium of library for independent governance. And then we become one of the clients, essentially, if we want to innovate more, and we'll do it as a client. But the whole structure should not be governed by us. The only reason why it's governed by us right now is because we're in the setting up stage. Um, and then obviously, if you know of other libraries, library entities, et cetera, that might want to be part of that library consortium, please also let me know. So thank you so much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take questions. And I hope there was some new information for you in there. It was very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Thanks very much for that. No? There we are. Uh, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm curious from your perspective as a researcher and also working on this project, like the nub of the issue, at least Harrison seems to be around, there's tenure promotion, that whole sort of incentivization. So even let's just say this was built tomorrow, it was fully fledged and working. Like what where do you see as a couple of key places where we to start changing hearts and minds around how that system works and how people not only are incentivized but choose to be incentivized. Yeah, and this is a really complicated question, of course, right? Because there are many different players in, in, in that equation. The way I'd like to, or we would like to think about it is that if we build a full-fledged system tomorrow, people would not feel like they can replace their current efforts with the existing publishers because of the incentive structures, right? So as such, this is why strategically we want to be sort of like an enhanced preprint server. We want to have all the functionalities that hopefully, hopefully you'll have all the functionalities that, that, that researchers value, that scholars value in terms of the feedback mechanism, making their lives easier in terms of disseminating their work and getting, you know, interacting with the community. But we realize, of course, that it'll take some time to change people's minds in terms of in the processes, in terms of how people are evaluated, right? So um, this is why I didn't, men didn't mention or talk about this at all. This is why, for example, the IP of everything will stay with the researchers, right? It's similar when you go to BioArchive or the archives in general uh, and, and publish a preprint there. You can do whatever you want with that preprint. They don't own it, right? Um, and in fact, you decide what kind of license you want to apply to your to your work, right? When you submit, so that's exactly what we want to have as well. And then people can submit to other journals, no problem. Or in fact, we don't even say that this is a journal, right? Now. Of course, it's very easy for us to then go and say have like a tag that essentially says, after so much feedback has come in, here we check, right? Maybe this is even something that an author can decide. After a certain, you know, this after two people have provided feedback, they get the option to now put a check mark on peer reviewed. Maybe they want to wait longer, they don't feel it's quite ready yet. Right? So there's different models here you can imagine that are implemented that way. Now, I think what's going to be really important is that we provide more equitable statistics, metrics that researchers and scholars can use to essentially say, hey, look, I've done well, <laughs> right? It's not the H index. Um, it's not gonna be indexed maybe on scope with, I don't know, whatever, but I've done, I've done well and you should recognize it because it has been like formally peer reviewed, even if it was, was post-publication peer reviewed, right? Um, people have cited it, people have read it, whatever the metrics is you want, you want to choose. And then sort of like the hope is that slowly, the tenure committees, the hiring committees, the university principals, right, will recognize these pieces of information as at least equally valuable than the traditional ones. And I think this is how we can slowly change minds. It'll, it'll be like my prediction is it'll be a long process, but you know, if you don't start, never happen. Sorry, long winded answer, but it's a complicated issue. No, I really appreciate to go into that. I think that's a really, I think that's a very kind of valid perspective that we're probably looking at sort of generational change rather than 
some grand gestures that makes things change over what we can um, highly unlikely. If I can, or if somebody else, out of curiosity, when you say we need funding, you get the dollar signs up there. What would you actually do you have a sense of what it is you're looking for to kind of accomplish you know, exactly what you outlined here? Yeah, so we estimate that for the initial development, we need about a million order of, of magnitude dollars um, to get uh, a working platform and enough infrastructure, infrastructure to start building functional pillars, essentially have a flexible, um, enhanced uh, um, preprint service, sort of with the functionality I presented. So certain aspects might not be able to implement right away, like for example, an authoring tool, like a writing interface, or like a you know a better version of Google Docs if you want. <laughs> um, with with that amount of funding, but I think a billion dollar would get us like to that point. And we have some funds already, mm -hmm. um, both through um, Neuromatch as well as through um, a donor. Um, but we need obviously more to achieve that. Everything above that would be great, of course, because the more functionality we can build, I think the more attractive the platform will be. Should that bring much sense? Okay, hey, do we have any other questions? I'm um, that's very interesting. Thank you for all those thoughts. Um, Wondering on the next ones, we've talked a bit about funding and now what your idea is for the library consortium. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? What do you what your vision is for the library consortium? Yeah, I mean it's quite literally um, like a series of libraries, essentially, like as many as possible. So if, like, so sorry, I should step back. So there's there's two aspects to that. One is the governance of um, the whole enterprise. Particular scale nexus, right? The actual sort of uh, so scale nexus would pretty much be the uh, uh, the archive, the database, and the tools, the API, um, the code, etc. Um, that needs independent governance. So you can imagine, like you know, like a model similar to the Linux Foundation model, where there's a bunch of you know independent um, stakeholders with, from nonprofit organizations. Um, in that case, um, in this, in our case, it would be mostly libraries or library associations, right? That would come together. Obviously, not all the libraries in the world, because that's not how governance effectively works. Um, but a subset is representative that is like distributed across the globe enough that we can get the diversity of voices. Now, the second part is sort of like the actual um, implementation of the uh, architecture of of the archive. And the participation in that, and there we hope that you know virtually all libraries in the world ultimately will participate. And whether that is uh, active or passive, whether that is with financial support or without, that depends on on many factors, I guess. Um, but but ultimately, I think that every library has an interest that wants to serve their scholars has an interest to be part of this. Um, if for nothing else, just to host a tiny piece of the database and it's, it's database so with replication etc so that you know if the library were to crash and burn would like erase part of the data of course okay that's the really really interesting and so when i was thinking about it one of the things you, you're probably aware that we do support a wide variety of infrastructure including you know open journal systems and we have an institutional repository that's on open infrastructure as well. Um, but I think one way to really get libraries um, invested in this would be to ensure that you know this platform integrates with all of those other platforms too. Um, particularly, you know, if it can integrate with OJS and you know we can have a plugin that we can bring our journals into this platform so that when you know they go through the open peer review process on Scholars Nexus, one of the publishing options would be all of those open journals that are supported by libraries from all around the world. And the same goes for you know an IR. Um, you know, well, tons of uh, researchers are going to have to publish in the IR to meet grant requirements, particularly as we move to immediate open access. So having that as a publishing option, so that we can send papers directly to 
the IR, particularly if an institution is considering, you know, a rights retention policy, open access policy or something like that would be incredibly useful just to be able to facilitate that kind of, um, you know, push of information. And it's probably easier to do those pieces than it is to work with the, you know, the, the, the sprinters, whoever else from, from the algorithm and that it supports community, let open access publishing across the country. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so that was the question. It was just a, a few yeah. comments and things that I was thinking about yes. while I was listening. Um, but we do have a couple of questions from the um, uh, in the chat, so I'll, I'll I'll read one of those and then yep. okay, you can maybe comment on. And there's two of them, so okay, we'll do one first. Um, so the first one is from um, an anonymous person, and they said, um, "I love the ability for more reviewers to weigh in. However, is there a system to ensure that the reviews are from other scholars in the field?" Are there other ways to ensure reviews and the like dislike system are not hijacked from trolling or hurting scholar reputation? Yes. Obviously, we have thought about this because it's very easy to create sort of like paper mill type cycles, right, with uh, mutual support. Um, but I also think that there's a lot of algorithms that are quite easy to establish that um, would allow us to detect these kind of things. There will definitely be flagging. So, like, the number one worry that we typically get is, you know, what if a review is abusive or inappropriate or whatever it is, or just spammy, right? You don't want that to be sort of like a permanent, in the permanent record kind of thing, right? And and so there will definitely be flagging mechanisms that we will implement to make sure that that um, doesn't happen and including also like algorithmic stuff. Now, as a reviewer, you will get, you will get scored, right? So the reviews of themselves will get evaluated. So as such, if there is like anom anomalies in the way you review or what you review, for example, then that, that should, should come up. In the same way, like, obviously it's going to be really hard to say, you know, um, if person A and person B are not connected to publications and they keep reviewing one another, that might just mean that they're working on the same topic. That might also mean that they have a hidden agreement with one another. And that is true in, in, in the regular publishing world as well. Time to time, something like that becomes public because someone detects these kind of things. These are difficulties that we have to deal with in the system. So I have another question that relates to that. Um, so have you considered using a PID like ORCID to yes. authenticate yeah. users? So yeah, that yeah. Kind of yeah, so I haven't talked about this at all. So um, yes, we will use ORCID, most likely. That's our plan right now, at least. Um, and um, despite the fact that there's the option to review anonymously, we will keep the identity consistent. So if you are an anonymous reviewer X, you'll be the same anonymous reviewer X across different platforms for us. We might not call you reviewer X across different platforms or papers or whatever it is or reviews, but we will have that identity locked away. And that is very important for us because that allows us to essentially, you know, make sure that uh, we know who you are in case there's inappropriate behavior, in case there's any like issues coming up. And also maybe at some point, once you get tenure, you just want to say like, hey, I want to flip the switch and because now I have nothing to lose anymore kind of thing. I want to make it public now. I don't feel threatened anymore, right? I'm not in a vulnerable position anymore. And I feel confident I can make my reviews public. In which case we need to know <laughs> which ones were real reviews. Great, that's, that's awesome. Um, so the next question is from uh, Sandra McEwen, um, from, who's also from the library. Um, and her question relates to um, publishing after publishing on Scholar Nexus or uh, Open Hope, or whatever it's called. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, tree, yeah. Oh, tree. That's what it is. Yeah. Um, so the question is, is if researchers post on Scholar's Nexus and get the peer review process done there and then post to, and then submit to a journal, is the scholar nexus process considered like an enhanced preprint and not an actual publication? Because a lot of journals will be like, hey, you already published this, we don't want to publish it, it's not a preprint. Yeah, so I guess this is a new territory. So we'll we'll, we'll find out what uh, what the journals will actually do with it, right? When uh, when preprint service first came out, um, journals uh, struggled a little bit and then they said, well, it's just for preprint, that's fine with us, right? And as soon as you enter, and actually different journals have different policies, some say as soon as you enter a review process with us, you cannot update um, the preprint anymore because anything that gets done within our journal system is not proprietary. 
And some journals say, no, you can, whatever, it doesn't matter. The only thing you cannot do is take the final published version and update it. There's, there's different models out there, right? So we'll have to see how, how uh, journals react to that. We have probed a little bit, um, sort of like informally, and our understanding is as long as we provide a feedback mechanism without saying, here's a journal collection, we call it a journal, that shouldn't really be a problem because all we do is enhance the quality of the submissions to the real journal, right? So that would be the perception in that case. But again, this is something, this is new territory. We'll, we'll find out. There is post-publication peer reviews, at least a possibility for it on some of the uh, preprint servers, on the archives. It's very rarely used, but journals are fine with that. So as far as I know, at least. Any other questions in the room? Hi, thanks for the presentation. It's so nice and uh, it's very exciting. So being a librarian, we want to have it. This is tomorrow. Um, my question is that, you know, publishing is kind of, of a very commercial entity. Like they are always in the profit motive and they have been um, been in the, in the market for a long time. So when we're making this open access one, what kind of competition uh, will be you're facing and what how will affect your sustainability? So competition from the for-profit publishers you're talking? Yeah. yeah, so this is this is this is an interesting question. We've often we spent obviously spent some time thinking about that also together with our advisory board. And it's um it's not easy to find an answer for that. So one one thing, thing, one fear you might have is that as soon as we provide like a system like this that researchers might might prefer, for-profit publisher will essentially just copy it, right? They have the they have the resources to essentially copy it. Now, the reason why this might not be so easy for them to do is that they have very well established big infrastructure. Right, both in terms of workflow, personnel, software, etc. So flipping the switch fast to something new for them is actually kind of hard. And so we hope that that hurdle will give us a strategic advantage. Now, if we get to the point where we really threaten for public for the big for-profit publishers, then we're in a good situation, of course. And if in the end it turns out they are going to they're, they're going to copy us because this is better and come up with a system that is maybe still somewhat for profit, I don't know, but actually helpful to the researchers without the data collection, et cetera, then I would argue it's a win-win situation. I'm not saying that for profit is necessarily bad, right? Because in a certain way, the, the open market, you can argue, spurs innovation because there is potentially profit to be made and people are driven by that, etc. So it's a it's it's, it's a balance as, as usual in life, right? It's not just like black or white. Um, I think we're at a stage where we're locked in with the current for-profit publishers and in particular the system that they, they have put in place. And I think we're we really need the flexibility to innovate. We need to we need a playground to experiment and to actually build platforms that serve scientists, in particular modern science, modern scholarly work better. And if the if the existing publishers in the end end up copying it and providing us with the correct servers, then not for everyone to decide what where they want where they want to pay, put their money, I guess. Want to um, convince any government uh, or any yes any government and transfer the system to them rather than be taking that part. Yeah. So, do we want to uh, get the governments on board? Absolutely. So, this is a whole other aspect I haven't talked about at all. So, there's big pushes, especially in Europe and the United States right now, and to a certain degree in Canada as well, with the revision of the Tri-Council policy on open access. Um, to really make scholarly work accessible 
for the scholars and the public, right? And that is very much like the digest of is very much diamond open access. Now, of course, there's all kinds of lobbying going on, et cetera, et cetera, right? We know what happened with Plan S and, and other, other uh, plants like this. Um, but at least there's a push right now. Uh, like last year, the, uh, the what's it called OSTP um, has, uh, has put, uh, put, uh, made a big statement, essentially. Um, and I think it was in around April or May, I forget now this year, that the European Union has made a big statement that essentially said, we want diamond open access. Whether that will actually happen <laughs> will depend on all the negotiations that always take place after these big, bold statements, right? So we'll, we'll see what, what that leads to. But the desire is definitely there. I think there is a lot of frustration um, from the general public saying, our taxpayers' money is used for research that we, in particular, these are often like, patient advocacy groups, et cetera, cannot access, right? And that's just like unacceptable. So in that sense, I think, and then, and then there's the whole aspect sort of like the more cultural, I guess, or um, current aspect of how science is perceived um, in the world by the general public, right? The doubts around, you know, the scientific process, scientific validity, et cetera. And I think, that the governments see that there is value to full transparency in reestablishing a certain trust in um, academia and the scientific process. That's how I kind of like read it, the situation right now. Again, like, you know, if I had a crystal ball, like, I wouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> uh, but my hope is at least that now is the right time. There's a real will to change things. The other aspect, and I think this is where Queens in particular has particular strength in North America, is the whole sort of like a, a global sustainability um, aspect of, of anything really, but, but also science and scientific impact. Right? As I mentioned earlier, the current scientific publishing system is really geared towards the global north. And, and that's not good. We are essentially like locking out a big part of the world's population. And research has shown that actually the best way to distribute funds for research would be a uniform distribution, pretty much. Because so many people have ideas that never get the chance to actually express those ideas. And you never know, you know, where they where they will lead. But that's again like scientific funding is a whole other whole other uh, issue that uh, is partially related to this, but I don't want to recover. But it's just to say that I think that there's an increased recognition that we actually hurt ourselves by excluding a big part of the world from the scientific process. Before you talk, I think you started to get into what my question was going to be about the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, um, but also to take that a step further. I mean, the way the system is now, the gatekeepers, etc., it seems to be all about keeping the colonial system in place. And when I hear about APCs and waivers, I, I think it's the same have and have nots where. You, you know, in the global south, cannot participate. We'll give you a waiver, but you're not an equal member. And I'm wondering how we can leverage that, that UN Sustainable Development Goal um, decolonizing to bring, especially faculty, as well as, you know, tenure committees and hiring committees to think in those, in, with that lens, as opposed to just the lens of you know, this um, impact factor. As, as being a proxy for, for really you know, the scholarship and evaluating the scholarship, because that seems like a shortcut, <laughs> as opposed to putting in the harder work to think about what a true global scholarly communication system would look like. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've uh, totally hit the nail on the head here. Like, I don't have the answer to your question. 
uh, unfortunately. But but yes, you're 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 absolutely right. Like uh, this has tremendous impact, um, and it's not it's not trivial. There's no trivial solution in how we can change the process, right? Um, I think advocacy, um, raising awareness, education, all these different aspects is critical. Um, I try to do my part when I can, but it's hard, right? It's it's very hard. And in particular, the hard part is that the people that you know we think about having done well as academics have done well in the current system. So the current system has supported them in a certain way. They have no interest in changing the current system. Or well, very few of them would would like think beyond their little sphere, right? And say like, well, it might hurt myself, but it's better for you. So, so it's a very hard question. So how, you know, and, and who, who, who do we listen to? Well, those who have done well, those leaders, right? Those are the people that make the policy that like, because they have done well, so they, they must be smart. Right? So it's sort of like a bit of a very a strange chicken and egg problem or a vicious cycle that I'm, I have no idea how do we get, how we get out of that, to be honest. But I think ultimately raising awareness, talking about it is important. And and what gives me hope is that when when I talk to the to the to the early career researchers, the younger generation, right? And uh, so so until recently I was the graduate coordinator for the neuroscience program and I had the pleasure of teaching the introductory um, class for them essentially. Um, and um, and I would cover various aspects of open science, right? As part of like, sort of like the toolkit as a science, as a scientist at that point, in particular neuroscientists. And I would always get like these puzzled looks from the students going like, what do you mean that's not the norm? How else would we do it? Right? So it's actually not natural to them at all that we lock away knowledge, that we have these like barriers and paywalls and stuff like that, right? When I tell them, you know, you get access to all the journals, but it's only when you're on campus, right? They look at me, oh, really? And then they come back next, yeah, I tried from home, it didn't work. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> and people don't necessarily realize, and, and even the general public doesn't realize, right? So I, I talk to people and like about open science and how important that is, and they just go like, yeah, whatever. And then sometimes years later, they come back, oh, like, I actually needed some information because of a relative or whatever, and I couldn't access it. Now I understand what you mean. So it, it really is like most people are totally oblivious to, um, to the issues to start with. But the younger generation is also oblivious in a, in a, in a good way <laughs> to, to, the, to the issues of the current scientific system because they're not polluted yet by we essentially educate them to become team players in the current for-profit system. And I think when we can start early, we might have a way to sort of like um, change minds in the long run. And I've seen some good, just the fact of telling them aspects, I've seen at least a certain amount of discussion where the students would then go to the supervisor and say, like, yeah, but wait a minute. Why do, don't we go to an open access journal? Let, let's publish the data and the code as well. Right? And sometimes the supervisor's like, no. But in some cases, they're open to it. And like, okay, as long as you do the work, whatever, right? So yeah, but it's 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 a really how do we change things? It's a really hard. Um, Question. Okay, then we have any final questions? Okay, let's uh, thank Darren for an amazing talk. And thank you so much for the great questions and comments. That was uh, much appreciated. I always like to hear and get feedback because I was I was afraid I might miss something really critical. And there are there are still tons of copy and buttons in the back, so take some and um, yeah, stick around and talk for a bit. So how does that work? Do you have to stop this somehow? Yeah, I can stop. 
higher percentage. Oh, I see, I see. <laughs> 